and we should be good, right? We should be good. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for attending. I'm so excited. We had an amazing sign up for this, and um, this is just wonderful. So obviously it's a topic people want to know about. Um, in case you don't know, my name is Sharon Burton. That's me. That's a picture of me that my son took. Um, I don't I don't love that picture because I think I look wonderful. I love that picture because my son took that picture. Um, and that's really wonderful. Um, I've been in the communication industry for 20 years, um, which is a surprise to me. I didn't start out expecting this to be a career. I started out doing this while I was in college. And the bills were paid really well doing it. And um, I discovered that I'm fascinated by this field, just fascinated. It, it never, ever gets boring. I mean, there are yes, there are boring projects, but the field as a whole never boring. So the part that I am most interested in is the post-sales content problem area. So what I do is I solve post-sales content problems. Um, clients come to me and they say, we need help. We are broken. We are broken in the post-sales part of the uh, customer experience. And they say, really, I will help. Um, I also teach communication at various universities. I am teaching, I teach for the University of California Riverside, both for their online extension tech comm program, and I teach for uh, the engineering department. I teach technical communication to engineers. I teach about 170 students a year. So if you work with a young engineer who understands the importance of clear communication, please feel free to send me an email saying thanks. I will pass that on to my uh, co-teacher. Uh, we're trying to grow the engineers that we want to work with. So there you go. All right, so as a supporting role today, uh, to answer any questions, comments, concerns, issues you may have, uh, we've got DCL, and they're fantastic. So let's say a big virtual thank you to Data Conversion Labs for hosting this webinar. They've just taken it on themselves to do um, industry important webinars and they just they host them and then they find people who have things to say and occasionally they think I have something to say and I'm honored um, that they do that and I think that's huge because educational webinars that aren't around a tool are important and because DCL is doing that we have a little advertisement for them um, just tuck this information away DCL is fantastic they, what here's what they do they help you figure out content problems. That's what they help you do. Um, not like, you know, oh, well, uh, but specific content issues. And for example, where I've used them is when a client has giant buckets of content. They've chosen a new tool. They've set up new workflows. But they have giant buckets of content that need to be converted. And they don't have time to have, to have staff do it. And that's huge. That's just huge and they do it quickly, they do it easily. Um, other companies use them to help convert um, into ebooks. They do that. Um, there's just a ton of stuff they do. So they get to have a little bit of a commercial because they're hosting this, which I think is the best. Um, and obviously they're not just somebody in, in someone's garage. Um, they've got an impressive client list. I think we could all agree if that was our client list, we'd be very pleased. The Smithsonian is the one that I'm jealous of. I would love to work with the Smithsonian. How much fun would that be, right? Oh, fun. Um, and pick an industry, and they've had experience with it. So there's a real confidence that comes because they're not just kind of new to the game. They know what they're doing. So all right, so that's the DCL thing. Now we're going to get into the webinar. I should warn you, it is remotely possible I've had a little bit too much coffee today. I'm just saying. Let me take a deep breath and slow it down. All right, so we're going to talk about developing your projects in any, or sorry, managing your projects in any environment. So we're going to need to start by defining some terms so that we understand what it is we're talking about. Let's start with what is user content. And by the way, the definition of user content is probably changing as I'm talking. Because it is. Um, user content, my definition, I'm not saying it's the world's definition, but my definition is this is content that is created to face your customer. Now, this might be the content that your team is creating or your company is creating, 
Um, I would put into that this definition, I would put marketing material in here. I would also potentially put support material in here. If your support is developing knowledge bases that are available to public, I would put that into this bucket. It may also include social media that your company is creating and that customers are creating about your product. It may be um, posts that people are posting in user forms, both, again, the ones that you're controlling and ones like LinkedIn, other things that you may not have control over. Uh, blogs, both your company and other people's blogs, wikis, notes passed around an office. Perhaps you're, you're in a business-to-business -business environment and your customers pass notes around the office to uh, support each other. Um, it includes, it's not just the content that your company is creating, but it also includes what I call ad hoc content, which is developed about your product by anybody in the world who wishes to do anything. So people are going to just develop content, whether or not you have any control over it. And this control thing is real important. So I put a little table together, very pleased with that table. So user forums that you host, you being your company, you have control over the information in there. Um, user forums that you don't host, like for example on LinkedIn, you don't really have any control over that. Any content that shows up in those user groups, you really don't have any control over. Um, some of you may belong to Tech Whirler. Uh, it's a news group for tech home professionals. And um, you don't have any control over that. Uh, there are people who have control over it, but you may not be able to get them to take out posts or things like that. You don't have any control over it. Um, a wiki that your company is running, you have a lot of control over that. A wiki someone else is running, you don't have a lot of control over that. Uh, the online help that you are building and, set and pushing out to your customers, maybe it includes uh, comments. You've got discus or something going on so customers can comment on it. You have a lot of control over that. Community blogs, not so much. Corporate blogs, maybe. You as a tech comm professional might have some control over that, but that may be something that marketing does. And the reason that I, I like to identify the places where you don't have control is when it comes to that content, it can make us insane because it's spelled wrong. It's grammatically incorrect. It's wrong. It's, it's all kinds of things. And so when you encounter it, it can make you crazy. And my recommendation is to recognize what you have control over and ignore the things you don't. Because the things that you don't, you don't have any control over. There's nothing you can do about that content. Since there's nothing you can do about that content, avert your eyes. Stop looking at it. Focus on what it is that you do have control over and, and try and, and have control over that. Customers are willing for ad hoc content to be messy. So if you're thinking, well, but there's content and it's out there and it's about our products, but it's you know it's spelled wrong and it's and it's got grammatical errors and it's a mess and, and it should be right. Ad hoc content Regular people are willing for ad hoc content to be messy and ugly. For example, I have a 70 or 80 year old house. Seth, Seth, 70? I have an old house. And if you own an old house, you know that old houses have interesting problems. And one of the problems that my old house has is, <coughs> excuse me, is that I have, I have plaster walls and they have metal pipes in them. And because of that, my wireless internet does not get the range that you would expect it to get. So I needed to get some repeaters to repeat the signal on into parts of the house that it could not get to. And so I bought some wireless repeaters. And I followed the instructions for configuring them, the ones that the manufacturer provided. And the instructions were of no value to me. They did not work. And so I looked it up on Google. This may come as no surprise to you. All of us do exactly the same thing. And I found somebody who had figured out how to do it and had written, frankly, really horrible instructions for doing it. Unless you were fairly knowledgeable about this stuff and you could figure out what he or she meant. I don't remember if it was male or female who wrote that. And 
it was enough to get me in the right direction. <laughs> now, a regular naive user would have gotten nowhere with those instructions. And they were riddled with typos, and they were kind of wrong, and, and, and. But they were enough for me to figure out what I needed to do. So this ad hoc content has a place. And to make you feel better and to help your company feel better, remember that the content we as professional communicators are creating, our content is the official content. We are the voice of authority. We have no control over the ad hoc content. Our job is to make the official voice of authority as strong and as good and as clear and as correct as we can possibly make it. All right, so that's user content. Now we come to what is success? You say you've had a successful project. What does that mean? And it's important to define that because it's important to define that. When you say a successful project, do you mean it was on time? Or do you mean it was within budget? Or was it the content that you said you would deliver? Do you mean it was accurate? Or did it re reduce support costs? Or did it engage post-sales customers and increase uh, product purchases? Or something else entirely? Now, all of us would like to deliver content that meets all of these criteria. Few of us have the ability to do that. Not because we're not good, not because we're not willing, but because it is the nature of time and space. No one, nobody in our field that I have ever met has ever delivered the, the project and said, that's it, we're done. All the information that we thought our users would need has been delivered. There is nothing else that we, we would have delivered if we had more time, more space, more people, more bodies, more technology, whatever. Every single one of us has delivered and gone, Man, you know, I would have really liked to do a vertical market getting started guide because our clients are across different verticals and it would have really been good to have done vertical getting started guides. But we have a getting started guide that's kind of generic far more than we expected, maybe next time. Every one of us does that because it is the nature of time and space. I, there's, just, there's only so much time on this planet. There's, there's only so much you can do in that time. So we need to figure out what does successful mean because when we set the expectation for success, we might mean any one of those things. But if we don't set that expectation, when we say we've had a successful project, others in our company may look at that and say, but you're not successful at all because you didn't hit these things. So it's real important to figure out which one or, or more or something else entirely than the ones I said. Whatever it is for your organization that means success. And we, as TechCom professionals, to a certain extent, we get to set that, actually to a great extent. I think we have a lot more control over what we mean by a successful project than you may think. See, I knew that phone was going to ring, putting that phone over there. All right, now, your management has a definition of a successful project. They know what they mean. When they say, the last time we released product blah, it was a successful release. They know what they mean by the word successful. It would behoove you to find out what that is. You may think you know what that is because you've sat in that meeting, you've nodded your head, oh, yes, well, that, yes, it was successful. But find out exactly what metrics are being used. Does that mean they delivered it on time? Does that mean that they delivered it with only X number of bugs? Does that, what does that mean? Did it pass user acceptance testing? What does that mean? And then consider using that definition of success for the docs as well. That puts you in alignment with your corporate, your company, and you start playing off the same page. And that's not a bad place to go. Keep in mind, though, that the metric that they're using for product X may be different than this metric they use for product Y. Why is that? Because product X may be your mothership product. 
80% of your revenue may come from product X. So the expectations, the metrics for success are going to be very high because the bulk of your income as a company is coming from that. Whereas another product that has a small market, a strong market, but a small market, may have a different measure of success. Consider that when you are looking at the documentation deliverables for those projects. Given that time and, and money are restricted, more effort should go into the docs for your mothership product than for the small niche market one. So consider that. But one of the things, and this is a whole other webinar, but one of the things to think about, most companies now have realized <laughs> that most products, certainly not all, but most products, regardless of whether you're in the business-to-business -business space or the business-to-consumer space, most products do pretty much the same thing as the competitors. You know, yeah, there may be something special that your product does that your competitors doesn't, but by and large, products are all commodities. And companies are realizing that their competitive advantage is no longer their product. It is their customer experience. Customer experience is how pleasurable it is for your customers to do business with you. That includes the product documentation. So it is very likely that at your company you have a voice of the customer program or a group that is monitoring uh, what's called customer experience. The, that would be the phrase that you might use to ask around. And consider talking to them to start tying some of your success metrics for docs to the customer experience success metrics. Not all of them, but some of them because DOCS also fits in there. It's a whole different webinar. All right, so now that you've figured out what success means in your company, and you've figured out how to apply that definition to your DOCS, it's time to evangelize it. Um, you've got to let everybody know and the teams what success is going to look like for your DOCS. Because I have some bad news for you. For most companies, 20 years into my field, for most companies, how documentation happens is a mystery. Most companies, it seems to involve elves and cookies and weaving straw into gold. They're just not sure how this all happens. Um, and you've probably seen this in your job as well. People don't understand why having a, a spec is not enough. What, what do you mean? The spec isn't enough for you to write the docs. I don't understand why you need the product. Help me understand why having the product will help you write the docs. And you go, so we can see how it works. And they just look at you puzzled like, but why would you need that? Well, that's not because they're stupid. It's because they don't understand. So evangelizing what success looks like for the docs is a great idea. Now, I am not suggesting that once you evangelize that those metrics, the entire company is going to link with your arm with theirs and go dancing with you down the halls, you know, singing. That's not going to happen. Um, some people are going to say, well, that, that's not what it means. No, I, I think, and this was my favorite, I think that if we do a good job at the product, we don't even need documentation. I don't know why we have your group. Like, okay. Or somebody may say, well, maybe we need only that stuff in the docs, but I think we need this other stuff because we do. And you go, well, I understand that you want that. But we have decided that X, X is what we've decided goes into the docs because that's how we're measuring successful documentation. And I understand that you want this other thing, but we're not going to do that this release. Perhaps next release you will say, we can do that, but not this release. Um, but by and large, your project managers, your product managers, very often your dev managers, they're going to get real excited because they have a way to measure doc success. Marketing will get excited about that because it's all kind of mysterious for them. And they're going to like that. That makes them happy. So you know your environment. You know the best way to evangelize. But here are some ways to evangelize what you mean by success. Consider status reports. When you hit milestones, celebrate those milestones. Point those out in your status reports. Project reports. Staff meetings. Maybe you have staff meetings, um, both staff meetings as staff above you and staff with you. 
a corporate newsletter. Perhaps you had a customer who loved the new release of the doc. See if you can't get a small article about that in the, in the company newsletter. Uh, planning documents. Planning documents are a fantastic place to get those success metrics in because it starts to expose and tie what you do to the rest of the planning for the product. Huge. And then there's always that chatting in the lunchroom, asking people what do they think of the docs. Um, and keep in mind that you're going to get a lot of stupid opinions when you do that. But you may also get some really interesting opinions. And not all opinions are equal. Everyone is allowed to have an opinion, but not everybody's opinion has to be taken seriously. So if you get really dumb ideas, just ignore them. Don't, don't get upset. Waste no time you know, defending. Or you should, well, that, that's, you've certainly given us something to think about. So thank you. That we'll certainly consider that. Right? Everybody's got an opinion. You might be shocked. As somebody may have a really good idea, though. Somebody might say, gosh, you know, in the API docs, I've always thought we should do X, and we've never done that. And you just look at them, and you think, oh my god, we should do X. It never occurred to me we should do X, but you know what? You're 100% right. We should do X, and I think we could do it. Because you're not the keeper of all good ideas. None of us are. This is why working in a team is so, is so happy, because other people also have good ideas. They also have dumb ideas, but they have good ideas. All right, so planning, now that we know what user content is, we know what success is, time for us to start planning. We can now create a quality metric. We've defined success. We can start creating some quality metrics to meet that success, those success metrics. And the one I like to start with is create a quality metric. Set up basic characteristics for three levels or five levels. I wouldn't go more than five levels um, for your publications project. And decide which level includes what. So for example, level one. There's no index. There's no examples. We spell checked it. We didn't even verify it against the product. We just spell checked it. And we can all imagine a job aid, for example, where that's as good as it gets for us. Somebody said, my god, we need to have a job aid. Everybody looked at each other and said, I guess I could throw one together in a few minutes. It's the best we can do. There's, there's been no time for audience analysis. Different for a job aid, you just slammed it together. Thank goodness we've got that good then, off it goes. And there are projects where level one is a perfectly appropriate place to shoot for. Now, the Mothership product, probably not level one, right? That's not where we want to go with that. But we've all done a project, a quick little fast project, where level one was perfectly acceptable. Perfectly acceptable. Uh, level two, for example, it includes an index. Examples, spell checked, verified against the product, it's got an index. Maybe we've even copy edited it. And for, some, for many projects, level two is as good as it's going to get. That, that, and there's nothing wrong. And you need to define these for your own environment. And I always recommend having a minimum that isn't what I've got for level three, where it's optimized for readability. It's got examples. It's been indexed. It's been copy edited. It's been edited. Don't start with that as the lowest level and then build from there, because you can't hit that for every single thing. You want to, but you can't. And again, we're setting expectations, because you're not going to keep these quality metrics to yourself. You're going to make it clear to everybody. And these quality metrics, by the way, if you're localizing your content, are going to be very important, because you can communicate this to your localizers, so they know what it is they're going to be getting. I would include here, if we were localizing, I would include in level three, best practices for localization in place. I would include that. I'm just saying. All right. You also are going to need a standard work per, and I'm doing page here in air quotes because I know that we don't deliver in pages necessarily anymore, but a, a standard work per page estimate or per topic estimate or whatever the units of content that you're creating are. Um, 
you want to know how long does it take us to do stuff, to go from nothing to it is ready for the customer. How long does it take us to do that? So, and don't forget to include the time that it takes to manage your project, to research, to interview, to write and or edit, illustrate, proofread, translate if you're localizing, uh, prepare for publication, and then push that out to multiple targets. Um, the last time I was documentation manager, to push the doc set for the mothership product, to create the deliverables and push those out, took a week. <clears throat> and we had to include that time. And that was the week that the end of the project when we were all exhausted, which meant we made mistakes, which is not the only reason it took a week. If we were not exhausted making mistakes, it probably only would have taken four days. We spent 20% of our time fixing mistakes we made during that process because we were tired and forgot stuff. Um, and we knew that because we tracked the metrics. And we realized automating that, the tools we were using would not let us automate that. But had I, had I been there for a long time, we would have automated that and probably been able to cut that down significantly. Um, and we knew, we knew exactly where we needed to But we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't done this kind of planning and, and captured these metrics. Um, how much time do you guys spend in product meeting, project meeting? Um, in some environments, you could be spending five hours a day in project meetings. I've seen it. In some environments, if you spend five hours a month in project meetings, it's a busy month. But you need to account for that one way or the other. Um, and then depending on how your reviews go, you need to account for that time. If you're doing an all-day sit-around-the-table line edit with your reviewers, that's going to take a lot more time than if you're doing an online review where everybody's making comments in the same document um, kind of asynchronously. That's going to take a different amount of time. And you need to know how much time this stuff takes. You've got to. So I'm going to give you some example numbers. In, in the absence of knowing anything, if it's never occurred to you to track the time it takes you to do things, here are some numbers to start with that I have found work well. Your mileage may vary. Please do not say, well, Sharon says it only takes two hours per page to go from nothing to delivery. Um, and that's stupid and wrong, because in our environment, it takes six hours. Oh, OK. In your environment, I'm just saying this is the place to start. Um, to create a basic one each user guide, I have found about two hours a page. Uh, because most of a user guide is task-based, and as long as you have access to the product, it really doesn't take that long to create the tasks. The tasks you can usually put together really fast. What takes longer is the conceptual information and the reference information. But the tasks, you can, if you've done a lot of user guides, you know the tasks, you can usually burn through a bunch of those in a day because they're pretty straightforward. Now, why they want to do that, and what, and the reference information, that's different. Training guide, the industry standard for training guide is 30 hours per one hour training. That is the industry standard. Your mileage may vary. You may be faster than that. You may be slower than that. If it's a domain that you've been working in for 20 years, you're probably much faster than that. If it's a new domain for you and you're using a new training, a new online training product, it may take longer than that. But that's the industry standard. On average, that's what it takes. Uh, context sensitive help, again, depending on your environment, two hours per topic, because you often have to work with development, and there's a lot of testing that has to happen. So writing the content doesn't take that long. But testing it, connecting it, testing it can take long. Um, creating content, content that is appropriate to be pushed out to multi deliverables, that can take longer because you may have to test. It takes a different way of architecting the information, and you have to test. So that may take longer. Um, and then cleaning up community-generated content, I typically estimate about an hour per 500 words. But that's going to depend greatly on what kind of community-generated content that is, how good the writers are as a whole. Cleaning up community-generated content for a content development vendor, inherently the people who are creating community content are better writers than if you were doing it for a game 
I'm not saying people who play games are all terrible writers because games rock their heads. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that's a different kind of user base and with different interests. They're not interested in writing. They're interested in playing games. And sometimes they write about that. Whereas if you're dealing with people who are professional writers to start with, you, you see how we have a slightly different audience going on there. All right. Common estimating errors. Um, and you are going to make them. Uh, the first few projects that you that you start putting together plans for and estimating time, et cetera, you're going to have errors in that in that planning. And that's perfectly okay. Set that expectation with your management that that's what's going to happen, that you're going to be doing the best you can, but you're new to this. And definitionally, you're going to be learning to do this better as you go, right? So there is the guess factor. Um, the guess factor is an optimistic time plus some sort of fudge factor, which I, I always enjoy, where somebody, and you're usually asked for that in a meeting. Somebody says, well, how long would it take you to do X? And you say, well, and everybody's looking at you because they know what the, de the, due, you know, the deadline is, and you go, oh, Thursday or Friday, perhaps Monday, no later than Monday. And everybody goes, oh, good, then, oh, all right, that's fine, then. Um, so it's a guess, and you're just doing it based off your gut. You may have a really good uh, gut for estimating. As it turns out, I do. Um, I, it, it's a talent, and I, I can't even, like, get braggy about it because it's not something I showed up with, right? It's like being tall. I had nothing to do with being really tall. It just showed up. I am very good at estimating how long it will take to do a project. And I'm, I'm really quite good at it. Um, I got better at it as I did more of it. Um, and even though you may not naturally come to the table with that gift, it is something that you can get much, much better. Um, trust me, much, much better. So there's that guess factor. Then there's the, and we've all been in these meetings, the devoutly desired results. <laughs> This is the guess that makes everybody really happy. You have no, there's no prototype. There's no, maybe you're new to the company. Maybe there's no similar product. There's no information. And everybody is looking at you and saying, so you can get this done by next month, right? And, and you just look at them and you just, okay. sure. And that's usually how, how it's answered. Sure. And you've sat in meetings where somebody has said that to development, and development has just looked at everybody and gone, sure. <laughs> Better is to let you plan. And by the way, if you're sitting in one of these meetings and somebody is kind of pushing you to give them an estimate and you're feeling uncomfortable, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I'd like a day to put, to put this together to give you reasonable numbers. Most places actually prefer reasonable numbers instead of making it up as you go. Because we've all been on projects where everybody was making it all up as they went, and those projects crashed and burned. Or if they didn't crash and burn, at least they were real painful. And nobody actually likes that. Even if you're in a company that continues to do that, nobody actually really likes that. So it's perfectly OK for you to say it's OK. you know you know what, let me get back to you this time tomorrow with some actual numbers. I could just make up numbers, but I'm not comfortable doing that. I'd like to give you actual numbers. There's nothing wrong with that. All right, let me hit this. All right, um, and I see a question up about Agile. I have a whole section about Agile. Don't panic. It's coming. Um, all right, also, let's think about complexity. Complexity, in my experience, is one of those things that people tend to forget about because you do. And by complexity, I don't just mean the product. The product may be complex, but you've got that domain and you're good there. But the environment you're working in may have some additional complexity. Perhaps you're working in one of those crazy environments where the development managers have decided they don't want you talking to the engineers. Um, if you have questions, they say, come to me. 
and I will ask the engineers. And I don't know how anybody makes that environment work. I've never been able to do it because my questions have always needed follow-up. But the only way I know what my follow-up question would be is based on the, on the answer I get. And typically, I drive the develop manage, development manager insane because I'll send four questions. I get the answer to those four questions, and then I come back with follow-up questions, except they're not four questions now. They're 14 questions that are follow-up questions. But I couldn't have told you what the follow-up questions were until I got the question, the first questions answered. It could be that um, the development team is 12 and a half hours off from you. And the only people who know the answers to the questions you're going to have are 12 and a half hours off from your time. That's a complexity. There are advantages to working with time-shifted teams, but quick and immediate communication is not one of the advantages that you get. Um, it's just not. It, so there's a whole bunch here on this slide. Um, it could be that your reviewers never do their reviews. They just don't. And you know that going in, which means that you've come up with all sorts of ad hoc processes to work around that. That's a complexity that you need to think about and account for. Perhaps this project needed to be done. It's a high status project. And your company couldn't, the, the current staffing load couldn't do it, so you brought in contractors. And because your company decided to do this, you brought in young tech comm professionals. Not young in age, young in experience. Which means they're going to need a lot more hands-on from you than the rest of your team normally does. Or I've got a, a friend right now who has been told that all TechCom activities will now be handled by a very junior team in India. And they're very nice people. She loves working with them. But they're 12 and a half hours off from her, and they don't know how to write because they're very young and experienced. And she's not gotten the budget to do any kind of training for them. So she's having to rewrite everything they get. So the cost savings that they're getting by doing this, they are losing because all of the things she was supposed to be doing, instead of writing, she was just supposed to manage them. Now she's having to rewrite everything. So there's no cost savings. It's actually added levels of complexity that weren't there when they were dealing with a team right there in her office. I'm sure none of you have ever been in that position. You have no idea what I'm talking about. But it's true. Sometimes that happens. Um, it could also be that you guys have no idea who the audience is that you're, that, is, that you're writing content for. And by having no idea or by everybody having a different idea, this is a huge complexity. Perhaps somebody is advocating to write in the, in the file name field type the file name because they've decided it's possible somebody won't know what the file name field is for. So they're wasting time writing that kind of content when, in fact, after the research was done, you, everybody knows what the file name field is for. Nobody in your audience is at all puzzled. No one in your audience looks at that and goes, darn it, if only I knew what to put there. But I don't know. If only there, right? And people who are spending time creating that kind of content have taken time that now cannot be spent writing content that actually enhances the customer experience. So perhaps you've got a team that doesn't trust each other. I have seen this. I have seen real schisms within the tech pubs group and outside the tech pubs group, and nobody trusts anybody. And everybody is just being wackadoodle. Nobody talks to anybody. Everybody views information as a valuable resource. And if other people have that information, it takes away the limited good. I have useful information, but I'm not sharing it with anybody else on my team because then they'll know. See, if I told you, then you'd know. And then I won't be the only one who knows, and I won't be special anymore. I, I can't. I, every time, and I've only encountered them a couple of times, but every time I've encountered this sort of, of situation, I am stunned because I believe in sharing information. Because you see, I'm a communication professional. I believe in lots of clear communication. Wacky. All right, so 
Also, let's consider your development environment. You got to love the one you're in. You have no ability to change the one you're in, but you see, so you, you got to love it. Leverage it. You may be in a waterfall environment. What is a waterfall environment? That is one of the environment. That is an environment in which everybody focuses on writing the spec, and then when the spec is complete, then people start creating prototypes. The prototypes then feed back into refinements of the spec. So they walk this one back and forth until they have a spec and a prototype. By prototype, it could be a model. Um, that is generally what everybody wants. Good then now. And so it's each phase of the project gets completed and cascades out to the next phase. This environment is more typical in a hardware sort of environment. Because if you are building tractors, for example, you kind of need to know what it is you're doing before you start having the factory do it. It is, it is difficult to do an agile environment when you are building tractors. You can't have everybody kind of just crashing through building parts of, you know, creating, developing parts of tractors when at some point you've got a factory that's got to actually build the tractor. Agile environment. An agile environment is much more common in a software environment or in consumer-based products. Um, and what an agile environment is, there, it consists of small sprints where customer stories are created, and then the product is developed to meet the needs of those customer stories. Sprints are usually short, often no more than two weeks. Um, and the product is, is pushed forward in these small increments. Sometimes, at the end of a sprint, this is released out to the customer. Sometimes it's not. That varies from thing to thing. And then there are environments that are a mix of both. If you were creating a hardware product that uses a bunch of software, you can actually create, have both environments going simultaneously. The software can be working in an agile way, and the hardware is working in a waterfall way, and then it all comes together at the end. So if you've been wondering which environment you're working in, you can have these are basically the environments. And we have to function in the environment you're in. So we, we can't determine the environment, but we can pick the attributes that are working well in the environment we're in and leverage those. Regardless of the environment you're in, you've got to do some planning. No, seriously, I'm not kidding. You've got to do some planning. Now, in an agile environment, that planning may be more ad hoc but you still need to know some of the stuff that I have already talked about. So you need to know in an agile environment what are the customer stories and then plan out what content do the customers need in that story. And the answer may be none. It may be that, that what the product is doing in this particular sprint has very little customer impact from a use it point of view. What do I mean by that? It could be that somebody has put together a customer story where customers are going to want to create these reports ad hoc very quickly. But it really isn't changing the, pro the steps to creating a report. Or the steps are like, there's like five steps, right? There's just nothing to it. It's five steps. But what they're doing in this, in this particular sprint is massively overhauling the back end. Your customer doesn't care the back end has been overhauled. They just care they get their report, five steps. So there's very little docs impact there. But we can also easily imagine a customer story that has massive customer documentation impact. Very often, for my clients, what I see in Agile, very often the product instructions are running one Agile release behind. And that's OK think about that. Because the point to Agile is it's happening very quickly and can be released very quickly. Except that we can't document it until it's stable enough for us to document it, which is often like the day before they release it to a customer. It is unrealistic to expect us to suddenly turn out X number of topics in one day. Nobody can review them. Nobody can. Nobody can. So to solve that craziness, everybody sets the expectation docs are going to want run one 
release behind. So if we're releasing, uh, it, we being the company is releasing 12.6 at the end of this Agile Sprint, docs are only going to be updated to Agile Sprint 12.5. And you get everybody to buy into it. Again, setting up that success metric, setting up that quality metric, you're setting those expectations. And if you get pushback, you can show, yes, but our process is X, Y, and Z. How do we do that in one day? Well, you'll need to have the docs done sooner than that. OK. But at the end of the sprint is when, the, is when it's ready to document, right? Oh, yes, that's when it would be stable. OK, how do we do that? Are we going to pull the entire team offline for one day? And how, how do we do that? Well, elves. No, not elves. Elves are not the answer. There are only a few questions to which elves are the answer. And I've never seen any question in docs that it, the elves are really the done. So well, I've got a statement up right now. It, in our projects, we will run one sprint behind. But they never, yeah. Well, then set it to two sprints behind. You, you get to define this. You're going to get pushback. But when you put the numbers down and you start showing the people who are in charge of your, your sprint manager, you start showing, here's how it's going to be. We, we can do this, or we can work with elves. And elves, remember, aren't the answer. So let's do it two behind, because we're screwing the customer experience. We're delivering stuff that isn't tested, that's flat out wrong. We're making mistakes. It isn't even meeting level one of quality metrics. It's shipping with typos, for God's sakes. Like the basics, right? So uh, um, I also have a question up about uh, that one I want to I want to touch on when I'm done. Let me touch on that one when I'm done. I have another question up. All right, so deliverables. You might have noticed this is where I want to sing it's a whole new world, but I'm not going to because that would be dumb. Uh, deliverables, they're changing and they're changing fast. You may not have noticed this, but we are in a wild west right now in our field. It is so exciting. Uh, I I love our field. I think our field is some of the most fun you could possibly have. And I am so excited about our field the last couple of years because it's all changing and it's changing as we sit here. You may have may be looking at delivering in all of these methods. HTML5, online help, offline help, ebooks. You're delivering to smartphones, you're delivering to tablets, which by the way are different. Um, and DCL can help you with that if you need some help with that. Uh, content sniffing devices. It could be our device sniffing content. It could be that you've got to deliver content that discovers in real time what device is being shown on and figures that out. Uh, and if you're not thinking about all of these delivery outputs right now, you're going to be. Somebody's going to walk in your office and say, we've decided that it no longer makes sense to deliver our maintenance manuals for our tractors as, as printed docs. It's too expensive. And the customers have been asked, and the customers said they would love to have them on tablets because they don't like having the manu having printed hard copy all over their shop either. They're moving to tablets, and we need to start delivering tablets. Did I mention we're going to do that for the next release? And you go, OK. Tablets, you say. Huh. OK. Got it. Any particular tablets, or do we just get to go for generic tablets? Maybe you can get away with delivering PDFs for that release. But there are things you're going to need to think about for delivering PDFs on tablets you've never had to consider because you've been sending the PDFs to the printer who printed hard copy. Totally different problem to solve with the same product, the same deliverable thing. So all of that. If you are creating content in a book metaphor still, it doesn't work anymore. What do I mean in a book metaphor? that you're creating content in chapter-based is the smallest unit of content you're thinking about. You're not thinking about topic-based anymore, or yet. You're thinking chapter-based. And if, God forbid, you're copying and pasting content from one delivery method to another, um, and there are people who are still doing that, and if it's you, don't feel embarrassed. There may be good business reasons why you've been doing that. And you know you need to change it. It's just trying to get your boss to get it. Um, 
we don't even call it single sourcing anymore. If you've been in our field for a little bit, you notice we don't call it single sourcing anymore. We call it multi-channel channel publishing now because we have to publish out to smart devices and the web and to and, and, and to. It could be the way you've been doing it up until now isn't going to work moving forward, regardless of your develop, development environment, regardless of your quality metrics, regardless, regardless. It may be the time to start looking at new tools, new technology, new process to see if you can start doing it smarter to account for what's happening. All right, with five minutes left for questions. I have a great question up. Um, in an agile environment, is it realistic for the online help to run behind? Yep, probably. If, and I say probably because I mean it. If what they're releasing in this sprint is something that a customer has paid a million dollars to get, then no, it's not realistic. Because customers spend a million dollars. They'd like to get some docs that include how to do their feature. But what that may mean is a negotiation that, all right, we can document what's coming in Sprint X because that is, we've got a customer counting on that. But we don't have the staff to document what's been done in the three sprints that are going on simultaneously for other customers or for general release. So we're going to run behind. And it's a negotiation. And if you can get everybody involved in this project to a Agree, and by the way, docs isn't the only place these negotiations are happening. It's happening across the board. You make those negotiations and you have those conversations, you might be surprised that everybody is making. One of the things I see with tech clubs is we often come to the table assuming that, well, we just have to get it all done. And we're making ourselves crazy. Nobody else in the other groups involved in getting this product out the door, how it comes to the table with that assumption. We're the only group that does that. QA doesn't come to the table with the assumption that, well, we're just going to test everything no matter what. They, they don't. But Tech Pubs does. And I think that part of why we do that is we inherently are very helpful people. The nature of what we do for a living is a very helpful thing. And I think that we come to the table thinking that, well, I should just, I, we should just do everything, no matter what it takes. And we don't realize or we are uncomfortable negotiating. And it bites us in the butt because we wind up tired and burned out and very stressed. And, we, and, it, and it goes every single release. And it makes us very unhappy. But if you open the door to, gosh, you know, I don't, we can't do all of this. We have to focus our efforts. Let's start looking at focusing our efforts. Let's start, uh, let's start talking to the rest of the team about what is possible. You'll discover everybody's like, I don't know how you did that before. You're right. To get the quality that we're looking for, something needs to shift. And what do you think should shift? And it becomes a conversation. Remember, we're professional communicators. We know how to communicate. It's time to. All right, so how do I recommend content delivered for Agile projects be coordinated for translation? Translation takes a ton, ton of time for our project and is required. Ooh, you're doing simultaneous releases with multiple translations. You're losing your mind, aren't you? You're literally losing your mind. To do simultaneous releases in multiple languages in an Agile environment, that, first of all, you have to be developing in some sort of topic-based environment that's the tool. You have to. You have to have reviews that are happening before you release. And I have to tell you, you're going to need to run at least one sprint behind, maybe two. There's no way that you can be releasing at the same updated content that is up to date with the current sprint that's being released. Because you're still finishing that content, which means it can't get to translation. Because it's drop dead expensive to send content to localization when that content keeps changing. And every day you're sending change, the same content but changed.
to localization. You, you've got to run behind. You've got to. And if the, if the company has the expectation that that's not real, you've got to put together a project plan showing. And you can attach dollars to that. You can show how much it's costing you in translation. And the company will gasp, typically, uh, and throw themselves on the floor. And, what? We're spending what? Yeah, because this is how we're doing it. And it's dumb. If we just reined in the madness back to maybe two sprint releases back, we're going to start saving X number of dollars instantly. And that will probably work. Um, all right. So I'm watching to see if there's any other questions. Does anybody? I forgot to put my question up. I got so excited. I have a poll up. Gosh, I'm such a I'm such a dork. Here, I'm going to run a poll. Okay. Launching. I forgot all about it. I got all excited with what I was doing. In the last minute, she thinks to run a poll. <laughs> Select the environment you're in. I'm just curious. And if you have no idea, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't don't think that that's, you know, people. By the way, nobody knows who's responding. So if you respond, I have no idea. We're not going to mock you because we don't know who's responded. Even I, who's running the poll, don't know who's responded to that. And there's nothing wrong with saying, I have no idea. It, it seems chaos. Chaos seems to be the, the, the development environment we're in. It seems to be a chaos. So far, it's looking very close between agile and a mix. Waterfall is, as I said, is really only used in a hardware environment because at some point, you've got a factory that's got to be able to take specs and start creating that product. And there are very creative people who are figuring out how to do agile in a hardware environment, but it takes a lot of determination to do that. All right, I'm going to close this down in just a moment. So I'm going to count down to three. If you've not voted yet, you wanted to get in there to vote, go for it. Three, two, one. OK, I am going to share so you guys can see the results. And before I let you guys go, I just want to make sure that there are any more um, Oh, gosh, if you have 20 languages, is it OK to spot test two? Like, you know what? If you have 20 languages and you only have time to spot test two of them, then that's your quality metric. I would say that's a level one quality metric. And I think you know that's a level, quality, a level one quality metric. But if that's the one you've got, then bang, that's your level one. You, in our project, we're going to meet level one quality metric, which means we only test two. Now, maybe we choose two different ones each time, but that's the best we've got. Um, and that's the best we got, because that's what we got. So most of you are in Agile. Most of you are only being 42%. It's, a, it's Agile and Mix, uh, which is actually quite typical, quite typical. All right, I'm going to hide the poll results. I'm going to let you guys go. There's my contact information. I want to thank you so much for your time. Again, wait, go back, go back slide. I want to thank you for your time. Again, let's thank DCL, who is here helping us in the background if we needed it. Um, if you have questions, thoughts, comments, or concerns, please feel free to follow me on Twitter, send me an email, et cetera. Um, thank you for your time. I hope, I, I hope you learned something of value. It's always my hope every time I do something like this. Thank you so much for your time, and I want you guys to go do something amazing. Off you go. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks so much. Oh, and yes, this was recorded, and you will get a link to the recording sometime tomorrow. Um, so, excellent. Thank you guys so much. Off you go. Ciao.